This week, Mikey and Rod want to buy an American airplane. You'll be green one day. A move that could bankrupt the company. I'm scared. Plus, Buffalo tries to sell a water bomber to Asian buyers. That's bullshit. These guys like that bullshit meat. But a landing gear failure stretches the crew to their limits. We're almost out of gas. Foreign visitors have descended on the Buffalo Airways hangar. Oh, hi, Justin. Yeah, my name's John. Hi, Justin. Only one sibling. This group from a South Korean aviation firm is looking to get into the water bombing business. Buffalo has just the plane for the job, the CL215. They're really impressed about the size of the aircraft. Company pilot Jung Soo Kim is still a rookie, and he's excited about the chance to fly this plane in Korea. Our current plan is introducing the CL215 from Buffalo to Korea. Hey, Nigel. Koreans are in town and they... Today, Captain Justin Simley and mechanic Corey Dodd are taking Jung Su and his colleagues up for a test flight. We've got a clear path. I just need a mule. The 215 is built for summer work. It has no de icing equipment or heat. Even the lubricants it uses can freeze up in temperatures like this. We don't normally do this stuff now when it's cold out like this. I mean, this morning we woke up, it was minus 33. It's the worst time to be flying. But without a test flight, there's no deal. We don't get to run them in the wintertime very often. We're stuck in the hangar all the time, so it'll be nice. <laughs> you want to come fly this thing with me? Yeah. And Justin's hoping the plane makes a big impression on his young co-pilot. Runway 28. F-Zero? Good. I never flown the airplane size like sales phone. Big engine, <laughs> big aircraft. Yeah. Done. The heading bug goes on 28. Ah, uh, 28. Yeah. Turning in back. Okay, so you're stick. Uh, okay, you're done with this. No. Alright. Is that? Uh, no. Your throttle. My throttle. Jung-Soo is happy so far, but flying a summer plane at minus 30 is just asking for mechanical trouble. And you're going to do a right turn, Jung? Okay. And hold 5,000. And mechanical trouble could kill this deal. There's always something. You never, ever, ever get a perfect test flight. Well, I mean, we don't. <laughs> Our track record has been, you know, there's always something you got to fix. They're barely off the ground before Corey spots a problem. 
the manifold pressure gauge shows the left engine isn't putting out full power. Tower, it's uh, Tanker 281. Taker 2 one going to give you a squawk code 4650. I'm going to turn in on you. Give it. Sure you think you can land it? Inbound. So when you're ready to come down for the next I'm scared. Oh, don't be scared. Hey, here comes the landing gear. You ready? Yeah, ready. Okay, gears down, three green, full flap to go. Now we're 200 feet above the ground. We see the runway. We're committing with full flap. And we're reducing speed to 95 knots. Okay. Okay. Now hold it straight. It's important because the wing floats are out there. You can't have too much wing down. Okay, now we're going to look down the runway. Yeah, okay. okay, sealed it. Now you can see we're keeping it straight with our feet here, right? Eh? Lots of fun, eh? Yeah. Jung Su's pulled off his very first 215 landing without a hitch. But Corey's challenge is just beginning. It's cool off of there. He has to figure out why the left engine isn't putting out enough horsepower. Yeah, that usually means you gotta pull the engine off. Which is, at this point in the game, we don't wanna be doing that. Because we're running out of time now, so. So Corey's checking the instruments first. We got lots of line anyways. <laughs> well, right now we're just confirming the manifold pressure gauge. To make sure we got no leaks in that system. So we don't go chasing our tails for no reason. As soon as you hit 40 inches, there's a big split there. Yeah. Corey's hoping the issue could just be with the gauge, not the engine itself. Okay, Matt, just take it up. So right there, go take your right hand into 50. They shoot compressed air to trigger the gauge. If it's working properly, the left and right needles should match. So right there, stop there. That's exactly what I was reading, eh? There's our power, yeah. We got almost a six, six inch split. <laughs> our gauge is screwed up. Our gauge is screwed up. We're simulating the engine's taking off, so right now, see the split's getting bigger? Yeah. Ah. So our right hand engine is going to put out normal power. Right. Our left hand engine looks like it's low, but it's actually not low. The gauge is incorrectly reading. But, but now we know that it's not the engine. It's a simple fix and a relief for Corey, but a short-lived one. Because to the crew's surprise, the Koreans have come up with a long list of other problems. They're asking... The cylinder head temperature? Yeah, first one is... Number one? Uh-huh. Yeah. Oh, the fluctuation. I saw that as well. It, it went down. I'm not sure what that is. Do you have the uh, the engineer, the, the other guys to fly with us? Corey, yeah, I could get him for you. Mm -hmm. First, he's asking. Yeah. So during the flight, the oil, in the, in the oil pressure indicator in gauge moving on, moving like uh, like this. So oh, okay. they're asking why. Oh, I didn't actually see it move like that. You're talking about like erratic movement? Yeah, erratic movement. But yeah, they think uh, they need to change the oil pressure gauge in number two. Yeah, we can do that. Uh, yeah, and they're asking why the drop levers. Yeah, they're not properly the, rigging. Properly rigged. We'll yeah. test it though. So once we get all these sorted out, we'll, we'll, we'll do, do another run. Yeah. Well, this is just a list that the Koreans had made up after the test flight. So they want these things fixed before they accept the airplane, like for the purchase. So that's what these guys are doing right now. But you say this thing's got to shake, eh? Well, it is definitely shaking. It is, eh? Like it's constant. Corey knows that a 215 will never run perfectly in this weather. It is too cold out right now to be flying these things around. It's minus 30 this morning, so. They're a summer machine, man. They're a summer machine, yeah. This cowling design wasn't really made for 30 below. But the customer is always right, and the Koreans are leaving in just two days. <laughs> Corey's soon going to face a much bigger problem with this plane, 4,000 feet in the air. Another 30 below morning in Yellowknife. And Mikey needs to talk to his father as soon as the morning passenger flight rolls in. I'm 
me and Rod are going to uh, Sacramento this afternoon to uh, an aircraft auction, and I'm kind of concerned because my father, we haven't discussed anything. So, you know, me and Rod are kind of going down to California half-assed blind. So you guys getting ready to leave at noon Monday? Yeah. Got a... We haven't discussed anything about it yet. Mikey needs Joe's advice about what bids to make on the planes up for auction. So is there any expectations or anything? How's that, Sophie just puking right now? Whenever Mikey mentions it, something always just seems to come up. Mikey's got his eye on one specific model that's up for sale, the Lockheed P3 Orion. It's a military spec firefighting powerhouse. It's the Electra on steroids. It's lighter, it's shorter, and it's got more power. Does anyone have any money? Do we have any money? Mikey wants Joe's green light, but Buffalo's getting cash strapped during the winter season. The company gets kind of financially strained this time of year, um, and it's not really a time of year to, you know, to start gambling money that you don't have. Like me and Rod are leaving here in a couple hours. No one's talked about it. I talked to Aero Union yesterday. They're more than happy to see us. I don't know what's your thoughts. Like, what's the tank worth to you? There's a whole bunch of uh, questions. Joe's still not weighing in. They put her outside for a few minutes. She'll come in near their door. Finally, Mikey gets an answer, but not the one he was hoping for. But what I'm interested in our union is parts, parts, pieces. We we survive on parts. We don't survive on airplanes, especially uh, APUs laying around, GPUs, air starts, all that shit. Right now, we got airplanes. Parts. He's really adamant that it was about the parts, not about the planes. Uh, planes are very easy to get distracted with, so he's thinking about parts, 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 because no use having planes if you don't have parts. But once they get to California, the boys could find the urge to buy the planes more powerful than Joe's orders. All right, see you later. Good luck. Yeah, good Got luck. everything? Right here. Mm -hmm. They don't fit the sea can, don't bring it back. <laughs> back at the hangar, Corey's still straining under the weight of the Koreans' checklist and their looming deadline. Okay. Like these snags that they picked on are so minimal, but some of them, like, they're actually, they're shittier to fix than most. At least one item on the list could result in days of extra work. I can pull that screen right now. A check of the engine oil screen. So what we will do is he'll pull the screen apart, and then we clean it into uh, through a rag and a coffee filter, which is quite fine. In the worst case scenario, we he cleans the filter and it's full of metal. <laughs> steel is the worst. Basically, steel means the crankshaft's coming apart or rings or something bad. And if we do see that, that usually means you got to pull the engine off. Here's the moment of truth. Once he cleans it out, then I won't be worried. <laughs> you never know, could be worried in a bit. You got a magnet? That's just carbon, that's it. This is carbon. Yeah, carbon, normal engine. Yeah. There's no shiny metal which means no serious damage in the engine. But there's still a long list before the buyers sign on the dotted line. And the next flight is going to test more than just the plane. Oh, so I wonder where we go now. And you don't have a rental car? No. <laughs> the boys from Buffalo have landed in California. Try not to be different, I guess. Rod was wearing traditional footwear. He Sported his muck all the way from Yellowknife all the way to California. The next morning, Rod and Mikey head to the conference's trade show. Oh, yeah, no, this is kind of cool. Like, uh, this is a whole new level of imaging. The McBrien's take some time to check out the latest advancements in aerial firefighting. Look at all the white people. Including infrared cameras. No. Oh. And fire retardant gel. Retard. That's wild. I gotta try that out. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Hold it a little bit. 
<laughs> that's uh, that's pretty cool, man. And you say it's non-toxic, eh? Yes. Yep. You should do a sugar. <laughs> How's it taste? Tastes like porridge. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's not that bad. I actually go for second. Yeah, calories. <laughs> 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 you gotta enter that in your calories. But the real draw of this conference is at the local airfield, where all the aircraft up for auction are on display. The real draw to go down to California was to take a look at the parts and pieces that are around these P3s that are for sale, because that's what we need to keep our electrics going. That's a P3. Look how nice she is. Look how clean. She's a cool airplane. But mostly, we're interested in the tank. In Sacramento, our mindset was the firefighting tanks that bolt onto the bottom of the airplane. Those were our priorities, because that's what stuff we can use right now that can bolt onto our electrics and put them to work. What they have here is uh, they got a constant flow tank. That's a high-end tank. So this airplane, it's a shame that it's not being used. It's a beautiful, you know, it's probably the world's perfect firefighter. As far as being able to run in and out of canyons and stuff, this is the airplane to do it, just because it's so powerful. But the company that owns the P3s lost their major firefighting contract, so they have to unload the fleet. It's unfortunate that they're not flying right now. I don't know, I don't know how to explain that. My father was quite right. He said stay away from the airplanes because uh, they'll distract you from the parts. And you know, he is right. The first thing I noticed is that it's really simple. Like our lectures, when you sit in there, it's just like, what the hell's going on? Once I was in the airplanes, it was like the sirens calling. They were like really drawing me towards it. So we went through it and I kind of lost focus and I kind of got wonderlust in these airplanes thinking, why can't we fly these home? They're good to go. Nice play. After one quick look, Rod and Mikey are already head over heels. Three years ago, these things what? Four or five million dollar airplanes? Now they're to the lowest bidder, really. Yeah. But we gotta take a look at this Bronco. This is another airplane we're not allowed to have. Tomorrow, they get a private demo of the P3 fleet. Resisting the temptation to bid could be impossible. In Sacramento, Mikey's meeting up with Buffalo's American Electric consultant, Don Deo. But yeah, this is a lot of old, old stuff here. Tomorrow, he'll help guide Mikey and Rod through the auction. Look at the Pony Express, eh? Yeah. This must have been the end of the trail then. Yeah, the first food mail? Yeah, first get. But today, he's guiding Mikey through old Sacramento, the city's old west district. This is the horse, eh? We think we're for riding a horse. Sure, why not? Hey, Pepper. What's going there, bud? This is before DC-3s, this is what they had to do, eh? This is before, before a lot of things. <laughs> and the one thing about the territories is it's the oldest rock in the world, but there's no history, really. Yeah, it's pretty bad when, yeah, 1975 is like the oldest building. But here it's like, oh yeah, that's right, right you know, puked over there. And, you know, that's where Burt Reynolds was conceived. <laughs> there's your buffalo, oh, buffalo right there. Buffalo Bob's. Oh, just like home. Yeah. <laughs> that one's all carved out. Oh, nailed. Yeah. Did you bring any green paint? No, I didn't. Oh. Hey, the village hat shop. Well, that's kind of cool. Oh, perfect. Is it the work? bad hat is it vintage? for you. An old Sacramento, eh? Beaver brand. Well, I reckon I'm going to wreck something. <laughs> oh, there we go. Moves like Jagger. I'm running for Congress. <laughs> Talking to me, punk, ba bam, ba bam. This is a Stetson. It's made out of buffalo. Oh, buffalo, eh? I've never seen one before. Rootin' tootin'. Top in the morning, lady. Actually, I like this hat. Enjoy your new buffalo Stetson. Oh, thank you. Ready to go. There. Damn, brother. First time I used a green shotgun, I kind of like it. Buffalo green? It's a nice color. Jeez, I'm starting to like this town. <laughs> I'm gonna just set up shop here. We're just gonna throw the cowlings on now. It's do or die time for Corey Dodd in the CL215. And take it outside and run it, and hopefully everything that we attempted to fix is fixed. One last chance to convince the skeptical Koreans that the plane is airworthy. 
Yeah, hopefully everything runs good. They head out to the runway where they can fire up at full power. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just go, I'll do a full power right now. But right away, there's a new problem. The left engine is spinning much too slow. The governor governs the angle of the propeller blades to maximize engine efficiency. Pressure changes in engine oil change the blade pitch, keeping the engine running at a constant speed even when power requirements change during a takeoff or climb. It seems to be need a little bit more adjustment oh, to do engine RPMs. Are you happy? I don't know. That's what I wanted to find out. If, if they're gonna, you know, if we just have to deal with that governor, we can always just leave Did it outside. change any? Hmm? It Did came up a bit, but not much. The Koreans are leaving tomorrow, so Corey has to change that governor tonight. No, it has to be changed. If the thing goes up to 600 now again. Yeah. Right now we can't go we can't go flying across the ocean or anything like this. So it'll be a late night for Corey at the hangar. While just outside town, Jung Su and his colleagues are staying up late themselves at Aurora Village. Home to the best views of the famed Northern Lights. <laughs> The first time I saw the aura in my life, and it was fantastic. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> but Jung Su won't be so happy if Corey can't get the water bomber running perfectly by tomorrow. The next morning in Sacramento, Mikey, Rod, and Don are supposed to be on the hunt for electric parts. They're a little cool, aren't they? <laughs> Go ahead, how far are you? This is everything. So behind that gate there is all their critical inventory for the P3s. OK. Uh, this is all the jacks and all the different um, sands for all the, uh, you know, lifting all the airplanes and stuff. This is kind of the stuff that we can use in yellow night. This is the stuff that Joe likes. But Rod and Mikey are more interested in the fleet of pristine water bombers just outside the door. You ready to go look at an airplane? Sure thing. Which one's your favorite? One seven. One seven? The plane whisperer. You know, Don's out there, you know, uh, having some alone time with the airplane. Well, that's a, a, a lightning uh, bonding strip there. And from the way it's kind of frayed and everything there, it almost looks like it probably took a lightning strike. And again, looking for corrosion, uh, any possible cracking or uh, leaking of steering fluids. So far, all of them I've looked at look to be in really good shape. So I mean, uh, they're well cared for. So not looking too bad. Awesome. I'm going to sit here in the center. Yep. We're going to clear those. I love this. Probably real similar to here. I like that. Never heard one of those fire up from sitting in the cockpit. Okay, two is selected. Mikey. Rod and Mikey expected planes headed for the junkyard, ready to be scavenged for bits and pieces. What we did find is there's a full office, all the records, the airplanes have been moved and kept in a serviceable state. There's a full operation here, like right, ready to fly. That one fired right up. Yeah, not bad at all. Seeing these perfect firefighting machines stuck on a ramp doesn't sit well with any McBrien. It is a crime, especially when they said all seven of them can leave. By Tuesday, if they got a call today. All we gotta do is figure out how to sneak one back into Canada. Sneak, yeah. Paint a big beaver on the side of it there, a national animal. And... Despite Joe's clear orders,
Mikey and Rod are plotting how to get these P3s flying in Arctic skies. Go for green one day. Corey Dodd is finishing final adjustments of the new governor on the Korean-bound CL215. We almost have all our problems fixed, so hopefully we can get the Koreans to sign off on it pretty quick. And they can go back to Korea, and we can go back to doing what we do. <laughs> but so far, the buyers have been sticklers over every detail. The amount of fold pressure was 28.5 for number one, and 29 for number two. So do you want the, uh, my, oh, my numbers from last flight? On this number? Or this or yep. today's number? Uh, yeah, okay, I have that all here. Corey's about to learn from pilot Jung Soo if it lives up to the Korean buyer's standards. Mm -hmm. We're well, gonna offset the aircraft for the condition for the uh, adjustment of for the little minor things. So everything's good right now? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'll sign it. Okay? You just bought yourself an airplane. Congratulations. Congratulations. Okay. You're happy. Are you smiling? Yeah, okay. <laughs> the new registration plate makes it official. Now, the real hard part begins. Somehow, Buffalo has to deliver the plane all the way to Korea. The 215 is designed for short hauls in warm weather, but this one has to span 8,000 frigid kilometers stopping in the Aleutian Islands, crossing the stormy Bering Sea, and fueling in Siberia before finally reaching South Korea. Only then will Buffalo get paid. That's got a whole set of problems, mostly with the weather. The airplanes are not set up for winter flying. Well, if we do go through the Bering Sea, uh, I looked at the weather there for 31 days, and there was one day I might have tried it, maybe. But I probably would have chickened out, I think, you know. Like, it's just not very good weather. It's starting to be typhoon season over there and all kinds of good stuff. So, so it's not going to be easy any way we do it. But before Justin and Corey can start their epic journey, there's still one formality, a final test flight. Some pressures are looking good. Oil cooler, almost at a quarter. The temperatures dropped below minus 20. Hostile conditions for the warm weather 215. But just a taste of what's waiting over the Bering Sea. Standing 281 tower. On departure, turn right at your discretion. Let's take off one thing. Let's check there. Power set. Climbed up to 4,000 feet, did our normal cruise airplane out, let all the engines stabilize. Heaters working good, all the throttles, props, mixtures, everything was lined up. Like everything was perfect. But as the crew heads back in, their luck is about to change. Okay, down for land, here comes the wheels. Roger. I selected the gear down. got an unsafe indication on the right main gear. You've got three gear indicators, and each one has a picture of a little landing gear in it. Indicator window did not indicate it here. Which tells us, basically, gear's not safe. Oh, what do you want to do? You want to land? 
In the back of the 215, there's these big blister windows made for search and rescue. You can see everything that's going on. And sure enough, the right hand main is not locked down. Thank you, 281 Tower. Clear to land runway 10. Uh, we've got to make a decision here. Well, nobody ever wants to land with any one of the three wheels up. Well, you like to have your landing gear down and locked. If the landing gear isn't down and locked, it is possible the landing gear could collapse on landing. Oh, what do you want to do? I was a little nervous there. I mean, you don't want to crash. That's not, you know, <laughs> I've gone this far without a crash. I don't need to crash now. Just, just cru cruise it out for a second so we don't burn fuel. Yeah, and... gotcha. And tower 281. 281 tower. We got to extend here, guys, for a second, okay? My first thought was, you know, like, I gotta try something here. So I just smashed the window out with the fire axe. And tried using the broomstick push the landing gear into its locked position. But the pole is no match for the heavy gear and freezing cold. It didn't pan out very good. Obviously, those aluminum loop sticks aren't meant for pushing CO2 D landing gear out. Oh, baby. Now, at 4,000 feet, Corey and the crew are all out of options. 4,000 feet above Yellowknife, Buffalo's 215 crew is flying with a landing gear that refuses to lock down. I need uh, something to push on that thing. Corey's getting desperate. The only thing we had on board was our pins that we normally, when we land, when we get out of the airplane, we stick the pins in from the outside to lock the landing gear down. I thought, well, I can try and put the pin in the other way. Which I've never even attempted that before. I didn't even know you could do it. Are you putting the pin in? Is it in or? His fingers numb in the freezing air. Corey and a six inch piece of metal are now the crew's only hope. Take that, get the fucking pin in. I got my hand stuck out there, and it's actually, I mean, it's still minus 25 out in the wind. And the wind chill at 120 knots is pretty cold. Hard as he tries, Corey can't get the pin all the way in. I got in about halfway and then I basically had to stop because we were running out of time. And 280 plus one is in the goal here. Go do the landing? Yeah, I'll do it. You got her? I got her. And the horn, everything's still going off, giving us an indication that the gear is not safe. is designed as a safety backup when the 215 is on the ground. But now it's the only thing locking the right gear in place. That's all we could do. I mean, in the back of my mind, it's like, you know, what's gonna happen here? Peering out that stupid window and waiting for that gear to start collapsing. Then at that point, the gear is not going to collapse. Oh, that was fun. Oh, yeah. The saving grace was that the plane was almost empty. Well, maybe with full fuel and full crew and full spares and all this shit on board that we normally carry, 
maybe the gear wouldn't have held. You know, I mean, that's, <laughs> we'll never know, I guess. The crew made it down safely today, but before this plane flies another mile, Corey has to figure out exactly what went wrong. Just pull it apart and make sure why it's not locking down. You can't land it without the gear locked down properly because you don't want it to collapse on the runway, right? It's a bad situation. Can't win here. This is, I mean, nor normally we don't fly these things at you know minus 25. But we use like a summertime grease. It's, it's a lot thicker. But now you get the cold temperatures. With the cold temperatures and the thick grease, moving parts didn't move as good. Yeah, go ahead. That wasn't allowing the gear to go fully down. Yeah, it's perfect, yeah. So after we changed the grease and adjusted, everything's good now. But this problem's been a painful reminder that this plane just isn't built for the cold. And that's got Justin making a new plan for the big delivery. Here we got a broker working on getting us a ship, a container ship. Really? Yeah. We just got to find a floating crane, in one of these ports. I'll land the airplane in the harbor. We'll get two tugs to hook up and tag it into position under the crane. We'll hook the sling oh, up. Oh, man, that's epic. Yeah, it's going to be cool. Now, is, is there going to be a mechanic? It'll be a huge challenge, and it's never been done with a plane like this but it's the only way. Mikey soon has a new problem to worry about. Following Joe's orders, he and Rod only bought parts, not planes, down in California. Geez, where's Rod? Huh, he's not even in there. When we went down to Sacramento to look at those P3s, you know, we came back and we had the opportunity to bid on him. He's still here. Maybe he's in Forbes' office. My father wasn't really too, um, you know, excited about it. 5,000 hours or something like but that. But now, Mikey's hearing differently from their American consultant, Don Deo. Started, that might have been it. It might have gone then. Which one? 25. Of 25, and I think he bid 410,000 something on 22. The closing date of the bid came and passed. We thought, oh, we missed it. Who bid on the airplanes? But we did. Oh. Joe got on the phone with me the other night, and uh, so oh. Joe said, tell them that one low ball is one a little bit higher. My father's taking a huge risk, you know, putting a bid down for these P3s even before we even got paid for our CL215s in Korea. Holy shit. So as of right now, we don't know, but we could be a possibly owner of a P3 right now? That is very close to being correct, yes. Mikey and Rod followed Joe's orders and resisted the urge to bid. Yeah, right with it. But Joe defied his own orders. My father can be very impulsive sometimes. I, he actually goes like out of his way, you know, to create chaos and uh, do things his own way. And you know, this day wasn't wasn't an exception. In the end, the lure of this ideal tanker was just too much for Joe. You could fight fire anywhere in the world with a P3 because you get fuel for it. And I, I felt it was a good tanker and it had a place in Canada. I felt I should bid on it. But he didn't tell anyone. I phoned Dale because no, no one was telling me anything. So I called Dale and said, Dale, what's going on with Sacramento? And he said, there's two bids. And it looks like we might even got both of them, if those were our bids. I'll be right with you. You've got to get this fight away. Mikey's always put up with Joe's impulsiveness. Not this time. And when I gave you the stuff on Friday, all that stuff, that's not the first time I gave it to you. What about? All the time he and Rod wanted to discuss it. I don't want to argue right now with, but if you don't bring it up, you go do something about it. My father started criticizing me that I didn't spend enough time with uh, the airplanes and know what was going on. Despite his strict instructions, Joe wanted Mikey to take the reins and bid on the planes. Why I thought he'd come home and, and put it together and, huh. and see it to completion. It could f the company. My father priest and bids on these P3s. Honestly, we didn't have that cash. Joe's impulsive move may have plunged him into a deal he can't cover, leaving the company at risk and Mikey fed up. Phase one of the Korean 215 delivery is set to take off. 
Are you excited? Well, yeah, we'll just uh, run it and oil it and fuel it. We'll see if the, uh, the boss says go or not here. This first leg is a flight to Vancouver, where a crew will load the plane onto a ship. I'm gonna check the oil it will be an unprecedented journey for an aircraft like this, if it can actually happen. We haven't been paid for the Korean uh, 215 yet, but I think, uh, you know, Mr. Forbes and my father are just waiting for money. So I think that's what's holding up right now is, you know, checking the, in the bank, who knows? Good morning, Buck Airways. That's worst case scenario now. This thing could be tied up in the international banking system and may come through today sometime. Well, can we, can we find out from anybody? If it hasn't left the old country, or Korea, then we're not going anywhere. If it's in international banking, then we're out of here. At this point, it's more of a, like a gamble on Joe's part because the Koreans don't want to pay unless they see the airplane on their ramp. Joe wants his money, he doesn't want the airplane to leave before he gets his cash. So someone has to give in. If some bank will tell us that it's in their system, the airplane's gone. Joe McBrien, call 200. Joe McBrien, 200. Uh-huh. Yeah, I did not know Union was on When fuel was in the airplane, we were ready to go, and Joe came out there and... Uh, uh, back in. Hey, uh, Corey. Yeah? We're going to run this thing and put it back in the, in the hangar for a couple hours until I get some... That's what we're doing right now. Yeah. So don't leave. It's, it's super, super frustrating. He hasn't got his cash. He doesn't want us to go. Three hours go by, but there's still no money in the bank. When you deal in a foreign a country and you deal with an asset of that value, you have to have your paperwork done. We were going faster than the paper was flowing. You got no money, you got no money. Got nothing. What? He's got nothing. Can you just shut it down? And just like that. I mean, it's his airplane, he can do whatever he wants with it. We're just a little soldiers, we go where we're told. Joe's gambling that if he holds back delivery, the Koreans will send payment. Dave, when's our uh, drop dead date for that boat? Going Monday. We don't get a transfer tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow will be Friday. It's like playing poker. I wasn't satisfied in my mind yet that, that we had a business deal that was acceptable to me, so we just stopped it. But if his auction bid in Sacramento pans out, Joe will need the Korean money to cover his bets. He's dropping hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, on a bid, spending the money that we don't have, uh, putting you know the company in a little bit of a dicey situation. Now, the future of Buffalo hinges on a hope that the buyers will blink first.